the, the, the charts. This was that system uh, there that developed, developed and moved to the south across the peninsula and actually brought quite a bit of precipitation on Monday to us. I just what, there's kind of this interesting comma feature that sits around all day there, just off the east coast of Scotland. I don't know, I, I didn't have a chance to look into it very much, but it just sits there and spirals around, by the way. Um, so, I, I'll skip over this actually, just to be super quick, so I don't want to hold you. Um, so there was just this uh, intrusion of uh, very cold polar air, which brought a lot of instability to the, the, the region that came down around the 25th. And that development was actually associated with that, uh, that cold air. I was going to look at this. So just quickly before I show the, uh, the forecast, just to summarize what's actually been going on here uh, in the month of June. It's actually been a, a fairly dry month. So we had a couple of big events of about 20 millimeters. On the 22nd, we had 12 millimeters. That uh, event actually only brought two and a half millimeters to the uh, Teresa station. So that uh, it shows you here there was actually quite a bit more precipitation up in the castle. So we're on 46 millimeters for the month. So just in case you're interested, that's at about the 25th percentile. So uh, the average is, I think, on the order of 60, 65 millimeters in terms of the climate. I think I've actually got it here uh, for June. So, yeah, 64 millimeters. It's a rather short uh, climate because they split between the old uh, station records and the new automated records. So they only go from basically 1994 up to, to the present. So we typically get 64 millimeters in the month of June. So if it doesn't rain until the end of the month, it will turn out to be the driest June, I think, from since I think there was a 44 millimeters in 2012. Um, and the next driest was actually June in uh, 2006, where we had no precipitation at all, just one millimeter. So then just super quickly, because I don't want to delay you any further on your restart. This is then the EPS gram for this week. So just to uh, remind you, I, I forgot to mention the dark blue line is the high resolution deterministic system. So this is the grid box nearest Trieste, adjusted to station height. And all of these bars and whiskers are basically representing the other 51 uh, EPS members at a lower resolution to give you an idea. They have different initial conditions to give you an idea of the uncertainty. And you can see a lot of these are kind of poking up and showing some signs of precipitation we'll talk about uh, of showery periods. Uh, uh, and uh, increased winds uh, on kind of Saturday through Sunday, which uh, we'll have a look at the wind direction in a moment, but it's likely to indicate uh, borer conditions. Uh, and normally this is an underestimate, of course, because it, even at the very fine resolutions of ECMWF, you're not resolving the flow through the gap here. There are three borer regions, one here in Trieste, one down near the island of Kerso. So last week they actually had the much stronger borer down in Kerso, and then down near the island of Pag in Croatia. So you see these three distinct regions where you get this uh, accelerated flow. So if we look at the, the Met Office forecast and wind this back, so those of you that are here from the UK, unfortunately, while you've been here, of course, it's been this massive blocking high over the UK. They've had uh, 28 to 30 degrees in London all week, and it's been pretty nice. But that's actually, that development now is going to move off to the northeast. Unfortunately, just in time uh, for some of you, if you're, well, you're going to be here next week anyway, so I don't think you're just too worried. But that, that development will basically move off to the northeast over the weekend. But if you notice here, we've got a, sign of another convection line again with the northerly flow giving us unstable uh, conditions. If we can pick those up on the, the radio sound. And this is going to be moving down through Croatia over the weekend. So on the EPS gram, uh, a lot of the members didn't have any precipitation for Trieste, but we'll see at the moment in the map that essentially uh, there's a lot of convection just up over the castle. And it's very likely that some of that could actually, some of that could hit us as it moves down. So we go through Saturday, you see that development moving down. And then you'll see that there starts to be a low development over the Atlantic, which will bring disturbed change conditions to the southwest of the UK. And so we'll find there are two periods during the week. So if we actually go to the maps of the ESMWF forecasts and wind back to this weekend, because I was just zooming forwards, through Saturday, you'll see this is basically, we've got the pressure lines on here. These are the precipitation from the deterministic uh, run. And you'll see this event, I've winded one right through, but if we go through Saturday, you can see those showers roof right through Croatia, just slightly off, and then they move to the southeast. 
And then later on in the week, I'm going to zoom right forwards because I want to do this super quickly. We find that Tuesday through Wednesday as well, we've got a lot of precipitation over the Alps and showers right across the region again. So it looks like, especially in midweek, of course, that's a long lead time, but it could be very showery again Wednesday, Thursday, and it's likely that we might get hit by a few of those thunderstorms. So it's looking mixed next week. You know, some nice days, but towards the end of the week, getting showery again, uh, I'm afraid. So it's a case of enjoy the weather, but make sure you've got a little mini umbrella with you if you're out and about, especially in town. Okay. The, temperature the temperature range, if we skip back to the EPS gram, now, you'll notice, this is very typical for the, uh, this is this bottom chart here. Now, basically, the deterministic is on the kind of uh, mid-20s. You'll notice the EPS often has the peak temperatures much warmer, okay? And that's due to the fact that complex topography, even if you do a station height adjustment, it doesn't account for the fact that uh, if you're next to the sea or up in the castle, there's a big difference in the the actual, uh, should we say, the temperatures. I mean, in the winter sometimes, it can be seven degrees difference between Opacina and here, even though it's only 150 meters uh, difference in height. Uh, so it's likely to be in the, the upper 20s. We're talking about 26, 27, 28. OK, I'll hand you back then. At least we've got them all together. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sorry, sir, I thought you might want to be talking Okay, um, so interannual variability. So one of the um, term, if you talk to carbon cycle people, often you hear is a so-called CO2 growth rate. It's nothing but the dCO2 dt, time derivative of atmospheric CO2. Um, Molinoa CO2 data is a wonder. Uh, it tells many stories. So we can, by eye, we see the increase in seasonal cycle. But if you look at it a little bit closely, you see their variabilities on interannual time scales. If you do a very simple analysis, you actually pick that out. So one thing you can do is really just to take the time derivative of this time series. If there is a linear trend, then it will become a constant. That will be the mean growth rate of CO2, which now it's like 2 to 3 ppm per year. Um, if you recall, 1 ppm is about 2 gigaton. So 2 to 3 ppm, that's like 4 or 5 gigaton. So that's half of the fossil fuel emissions is, becomes the CO2 growth rate. But when you take a time derivative, the dominant signal is actually the seasonal cycle, which is very large. But if you do a smoothing, such as a simple 12-point rounding mean in a, for monthly data, you end up with this curve, which shows actually the dominant signal is the interannual variability. Uh, so Dave Keeling and colleagues had noticed correlation between CO2 concentration and El Nino very early on in the 1970s. Um, even though they were not doing dCO2 dt amazingly, so they just look at the CO2 concentration itself and saw the correlation. And it was still in the case who said, hey, how, why don't I just do this time derivative? So this showed up very clearly. 
During El Nino, for example, 1997, 98 El Nino, you see the atmospheric CO2 growth rate is seven petagram per year. So that's like twice as large as normal. And in fact, so much so that for a short period of time, it completely swamped the fossil fuel emission rate. Yeah. So it's larger than the fossil fuel emission, meaning that land and ocean together, now it's not a carbon sink anymore. For that brief period, the carbon sink completely disappeared. The land released so much carbon, actually outcompeted the ocean carbon sink and, and more. Uh, so you actually get a net atmosphere CO2 to increase above the fossil fuel emission rate. Okay. So this correlation, you do analysis, for example, with the Southern Oscillation Index, you find that there's a delay between CO2 growth rate and Southern Oscillation Index uh, with a max at about five to six months. Uh, the max correlation is 0.6. So this is actually quite amazing if you think the carbon cycle is responding to El Nino. There are a lot of processes in, in between. You know, if you take global precipitation, you would not get such a high correlation with El Nino. So this is quite remarkable. And for 20 or 30 years, um, carbon cycle scientists try to uh, explain this, understand this. So now we have a relatively clear picture of what's going on. And you look at, for example, mechanistic model like Vegas plus the ocean side with the GFDL ocean carbon cycle model shows that first in the, in the Nino region, of course, you have a lot of, you have, that's where things are going. So you do have um, carbon flux anomalies, which in part has to do with upwelling, uh, temperature dependence of solubility of CO2, and in part has to do with biological activity change. But the bigger story turned out to be on land, especially in the tropical land regions, Amazon, uh, maritime continent. And now we have convergence between mechanistic model simulations that you know, simulates climate impact to the carbon cycle and the atmospheric inversion I mentioned earlier that uses CO2 observations and atmospheric transport to infer, to calculate backward where the source and sinks are at very large scale. So you see again the uh, very large CO2 release during El Nino from places like the Amazon. And mechanistically, it actually involves a lot of interesting uh, processes. Um, so in this work that called this in a conspiracy theory, <coughs> conspiracy in the sense that why carbon cycle response is way downstream but has a such strong correlation with El Nino, um, so there are several steps. One is during El Nino, subtropical land tends to have drought. So Amazon rainfall is suppressed. So it's just, you know, very interesting climatological phenomena. During El Nino, Amazon rainfall is suppressed. Indonesia rainfall is suppressed. Africa, okay, here and there, different. And these regions, because they have so big carbon fluxes, they're so sensitive to the tickling in the precipitation temperature change. So they all respond in the same direction because they have drought. And then come down to plant physiology. Uh, for example, when you have a drought over the Amazon, you would grow not as well. So you would take up less CO2. On the other hand, in the tropics, if you have a drought, you also have warmer temperature. This is very different from high latitude where temperature, precipitation go together. Here they go in the opposite direction in the convectively dominated regions. So it's purely climatological, but it plays into the physiological response such that in warmer temperature, decomposition increases. So on one hand, you take up less CO2. On the other hand, you respire more CO2 because it's warmer. 
So the geographical coherence as well as the climate plant physiology interaction leads to a very robust response um, of carbon cycle as showing in the CO2 growth rate to interannual variability. And another story of the interannual variability is actually fire. For example, again, during 1979 El Nino, um, there was major fire in Indonesia. Every time El Nino, there was fire there. But that year was very strong. The drained peatland in that region, sometimes uh, drained for palm oil, uh, so on, and released a huge amount, of, contribute a huge amount of the carbon release, going in the same direction as respiration. But this is a direct uh, combustion of biomass, not a slow decomposition. So we can look at such things both from satellite observations as well as mechanistic model and understand their um, impact. So some of us would like to say CO2 is a climate index, is a very good climate index um, on these different time scales. And now that we see seasonal time scale, interannual time scale, and even longer, um, carbon cycle really responds to climate. Um, so that offers a hope to predict the ecosystem and carbon cycle on interannual time scales. So this is some of the exercises we did, the high kind of hand cast experiments. Imagine if Dave Keeling is live, you tell him, hey, I can tell you what amount of CO2 is going to be like next year. So now show one or two paleo climate examples. So this one I showed earlier. Uh, so Michaela was asking the proxy data CO2 reconstruction. Um, so not only that we have CO2 reconstruction, we have all other kind of evidence, for example, temperature and say, say surface temperature as well as glaciation. Um, so like during the most recent, of the, we're in a great ice age. So the, during the glacial periods, the ice sheet goes to 45 degree, while other cold period where CO2 is very low, it goes even further towards the equator. And of course, when you get to here, you have some snowball Earth incidents. So this period here, uh, the Carboniferous period, when the Pangaea was, had all the land masses together, uh, corresponding to this period there, CO2 was relatively high. So we had a lot of uh, warm, humid places where um, a lot of coal got buried. So, so one very interesting thing about carbon climate interaction is on this time kind of time scale, there may be a slow uh, interaction between climate and carbon cycle. It's not just a um, only a, like a act and response. It may well be a truly dynamical interaction. For example, imagine a warm period. You have a lot of uh, carbon start to grow, and a small fraction of that gets buried in, for example, wetland. So slowly, atmosphere CO2 is taken out of the system. Not just atmosphere CO2, remember that's a small quantity. That's quick, you know, ocean CO2 just comes up very quickly to compensate for that. You need to take a lot of CO2 out of the system to um, be buried in order to really draw down atmosphere CO2. So there might be this kind of processes with different time scale in it that, you know, at least partly contribute to this kind of variability. You know, this is not, cannot be explained by Milankovic, right? Uh, we don't truly have explanation for this variability in the sense that we can fully explain the dynamics, but the data indicates um, interactions. So in fact, there is a thing called the CO2 theory of climate change that claims most of the climate ver variations throughout the Earth's history involves CO2 and possibly methane sometimes, uh, starting from the Fent Yangsang paradox. So I have personally, a quite a little while ago, quite 
uh, involved in the glacial cycle problem, mainly looking at first start trying to explain the CO2 problem. So that's, you know, the modern time we have the missing carbon sink problem. Go back in time, you have this glacial CO2 problem. Now we have so much data on this time scale, we can't really fully explain them. And um, so I had my own pity theory that uh, um, called the glacial barrier hypothesis that tries to uh, add a piece to the glacial interglacial cycles, which involves actually ice sheet carbon cycle climate interaction. Um, not you know trying to explain the whole thing, but just to throw in as a uh, something that is might be of interest uh, for inspiration. Um, so the idea is this: you think about today's Canada, that whole boreal area, it was covered under the northern tide ice sheet. Today, it's boreal forest, a lot of carbon. We just look at the climatological distribution of carbon, right? And you ask the question, where does that go when the next ice age comes? So the traditional view is it's bare rock under the glaciers, right? So this hypothesis, I just said, no, the, all that carbon, or at least a part of that carbon, probably gets buried under the ice as snow, as slowly, you know, covered these areas permanently. So later, so you see essentially you lock all this organic carbon into a freezer. So later, as ice sheet grows very large, the ice sheet starts to move. That might push out the organic carbon and would decompose, release CO2. If the release of the CO2 is fast enough, it might even trigger a deglaciation if, even if there's no Milankovitch. So that provides a internal dynamics, a mechanism that could generate um, quasi 100,000 year cycle as simulating this uh, simple model, uh, but very dynamic. So there's no Milankovitch force applied here. It's just internally generated. It, it produced by itself a, about a 90,000 year um, uh, time scale. That, of course, is not to say Milankovitch is not part of the story. It uh, may still be the main story, but just to say we have problems, for example, the uh, deglaciation uh, the in, before the Emian uh, called Termination 2. We have a causality problem. We have many other problems we can't explain. So interactive mechanisms like it might actually play a role even in terms of triggering uh, deglaciation. So back to um, modern carbon problem, the, namely the so-called missing carbon sink problem. If we, um, so the atmospheric CO2 measurement is considered very accurate. You know, we have all those stations, small and and so on. So we get that. Then we can estimate fossil fuel. Um, we can estimate the land use deforestation flux. And these, of course, um, go into this carbon sinks ocean land, and then the rest remainder is in the atmosphere. So percentage-wise, about half is left in the atmosphere. A quarter goes to the ocean, a quarter goes to land. So the atmosphere scientists and ocean scientists have done a great job quantifying these numbers. So they give a certain range here, They're pretty good, very narrow. Um, but the, the terrestrial scientists have not been able to come up with a number that is as good with small uncertainty. So we end up using a mass balance equation like this to say, hey, we know this, we know this, we know this. So land has to take up this much carbon. But we don't know exactly where they went. Did they go into the for example, reforestation in China or the agricultural green revolution, US uh, no-till soil or different other places. So we don't know. So that's why it was called missing carbon sink. And it really should be called residual carbon sink, uh, 
and now there's another new term called unaccounted for carbon sink. So that's still a major issue um, to try to uh, chase after. So as I touched upon earlier, understanding these things and how predict how they are going to evolve in the future will determine what the answer CO two concentration is going to be like in the future. So, um, so that brings us to this great grand coupled Earth system modeling prediction, where you would fully involve all these components in an interactive way. So traditionally, what we do is give me a CO2 scenario, double CO2. I'm just going to simulate what is the temperature change, climate sensitivity, and what's the precipitation change in the physical climate system. Now we ask the question, OK, give me a fossil fuel emission scenario, not in terms of PPM in time, but give me gigaton carbon per year in time. We're going to try to predict this and this together. So that task was taken on about 10 years ago by a group of models in a project called the safe for mip uh, model. So I'm not going to go to more detail describing, but to show uh, quickly a result. You can do this in a so-called coupled and coupled case. You consider climate carbon feedback. This is purely climate carbon feedback. What does it take? For example, I'll point out one process. If the atmosphere, if the climate gets warmer, so the solubility of CO2 in ocean water would decrease. Okay, colder water contains more CO2. So it would decrease. So that means the ability of ocean to absorb carbon would decrease. Another, so similarly on land, if it's warmer, the decomposition will be higher, as we talked about in the previous hour. So these are positive feedbacks. So you include that kind of positive feedbacks in the simulation, you get results like this. You include it, you get about 100 ppm higher CO2 when you predict to 2100. And temperature like half to one degrees warmer. So that is, of course, a lot, a big difference. So, so this is that first group of models uh, that uh, are involved. In fact, the first such positive feedback was pointed out by a separate modeling down at the with uh, Halley Center climate model by Peter Cox and colleagues. So when this, all the models got put together, what we find is there's a large range of prediction. This is you know, nowhere smaller than, for example, the IPCC different scenarios. Just, yeah. And in particular, the largest uncertainty comes from the land carbon cycle. So much so that you know, the models are going in different direction. And this, you know, at, that's, this is a historical simulation to present and then into future. So in, at present, pretty much everybody simulates <clears throat> a carbon sink, which is supposedly the missing, explains the missing carbon sink. But as you go into future, um, for example, the Halley Center model, which sound the alarm um, before this comparison, show that the terrestrial carbon pool changed from a sink to a source. So it would be emitting six gigaton of carbon, 2100, six gigaton of carbon. Remember, current fossil fuel emission is 10. At the time of simulation was, what, seven. Uh, while another model continues to take up carbon to 10 gigaton. So there's huge variability. So that, at the time, caused a lot of interest. So IPCC immediately included in the 2007 report. And then in the next report, this you know, is the so-called Earth System Modeling um, Framework. So another thing came out of Peter Cox's group is a prediction that, the model prediction that Amazon might actually die back. The whole Amazon would got killed in that model simulation, which contributed to the carbon release because that's also a dynamic vegetation model. 
So there's later study looking at what causes Amazon uh, change. Um, turned out Atlantic ST gradient that seems to be pretty uh, robust in the uh, climate model predictions uh, is in part responsible for change in the monsoon ITCZ movement. And later analysis shows that Amazon probably would not die back. The whole Amazon got killed. Um, but it's the southern Amazon that is in potential danger. So as the monsoon moves northward climatologically, so you become a little bit drier. There's a dry season. So dry season becomes longer. Of course, this is also where deforestation is ongoing. So the two things together might still pose a um, major threat to that region. So now let me um, uh, put a summary slide here to say that to look at biosphere climate interaction, now we come to think of them in two aspects. One is biogeochemical feedbacks, such as the CO2 feedback. Um, but you can also think of other things, VOCs and so on. Um, the other one is biophysical feedbacks, albedo, evaporation, and roughness lens. So this really modifies the three major components of the surface fluxes. So I'll show a couple modeling example that looked at really just the terrestrial interaction and the biophysical aspects with the physical climate system. Um, so one thing is vegetation is really a in is really a product of climate, you know. The, you look at observed vegetation index, normalized vegetation index, and EVI, satellite-based, then with precipitation distribution, you find a very nice correlation, and that is nonlinear, you know, saturation behavior. You could, in the simplest dynamic vegetation model, you can just put in a relationship like this, hey, here's my vegetation model and then try to convert that into albedo change, which you can get out of another satellite correlation analysis. And in fact, this is almost what this work did a few years back. This work looked at the Sahel drought problem. You know, the 70s, 80s drought was a, probably one of the largest climate anomalies in the 20th century. This prompted the UN to start the Convention on Combating Desertification. Um, but for a long time, we're not able to explain this change, which is so large. So in this modeling work, um, first, SST was put in as a driver. So SST gradient caused the monsoon <laughs> gradient a change, a shift in the monsoon, so it caused a drought. But one th important thing to note is there was this SCT simulated amplitude of change is so much smaller than the observed magnitude. So then soil moisture feedback was added, and then dynamic vegetation feedback was added. So go to amplitude after you add all these processes to more or less explain the observed uh, change. So this. Land feedback, vegetation feedback, turned out actually had a long history. Um, earlier, uh, Otterman and a little bit later, Charney made it very well known. Uh, what he called overgrazing causes um, albedo change, and then that induces a cooling anomaly over the atmosphere above this region that corresponds to a subsidence. So he actually derived an analytical equation uh, to that effect. So this Charney hypothesis is basically energy albedo uh, feedback. And so this kind of feedback was in the simulation I just showed. And however, um, most models, for example, in the C20C uh, multi-model comparison project that really look at this Sahel drought problem, practically all models can simulate uh, this drought 
when forced with observed ST. There has been quite some work uh, looking at um, ST from Atlantic Ocean versus the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and so on. So including uh, Michaela's a lot of work and commentaries on this problem. And later, you know, there's aerosol, all these things come into play, which I uh, won't be able to get into here. But one interesting thing is, if you actually look at the amplitude of these model simulations, they are all too small compared to observation. Even these two googly eye uh, models, including the model I just showed earlier, actually does not really get this amplitude right. Not enough. So perhaps Charlie's earlier idea, some human impact is still there. So the model we're talking about is still natural uh, vegetation feedback, not additional human overgrazing in there. So it's still an unsolved problem. So Yung Kang Shu led a multi-model comparison more recently. So there's some more update on this problem. So it looks like I'm actually have 10 minutes left. Um, so now we ask the question which a lot of people are concerned about is what's going to happen to the desert, in particular the Sahel problem. Is it going to be a drought? There's actually a somewhat a grinning trend, you know, after the 70, 80s drought that you can see again with NDV and so on. So this gets to the problem of drawing of the subtropics or the uh, intensification or expansion of the Halley sail. I know dynamically there is a lot, a lot of debate and so on, uh, which I'm not an expert. But here um, we look at, I show a, some results, point out the downstream processes. You know, when you do answer dynamics, precipitation is like your final destination. I predict the precipitation is going to change like this when you stop there, right? But from impact point of view, we care about what's going to happen to soil moisture and my crops and my ecosystems. So if you do a modeling like that, you actually drive these dynamic vegetation models, land surface models, with uh, say, same IPCC models uh, predict precipitation change. What you see is this. So the places with um, precipitation reduction, mostly subtropical regions, expand <coughs> when you look at soil moisture, especially when you look at vegetation. For example, here over Western Amazon, you actually have slightly increased precipitation, but vegetation just decreases. So as you look downstream, the impact of global warming becomes worse and worse. That's because more evaporation, maybe? That is probably a big thing for the increase in drying in soil moisture, yes. And then there's vegetation, dynamic vegetation process here as well. But I mean, there's there's current work emphasizing the the you know the that while you have a change in the in the productivity, you also have a change in efficiency and uh, the stomatal uh, opening and all that, right? So I don't I don't think that the latest assessments look like that. Uh, Jack Schaff is going to present next week um, some of his work and compilations about, you know, how to think about drought um, in various ways that include, you know, that, that cover whether it's, you know, meteorological drought as in precipitation, hydrological drought as in soil moisture and runoff, and agricultural drought Time. as in, yeah. you know, so, and they all give very different yeah. um, answers. So I think it, we'll, we'll get to that, back to this next week, but I think it's, yeah, it's a little bit more. That'd be great, yeah. I would venture to call this ecological drought. <laughs> um, so if you, again, put in dynamic vegetation in a model like that, try to predict the future, what you find is this is an observation and simulation. If you include dynamic vegetation, well, let me rewind. 
So because of this kind of dry in trend, so the desert actually will expand from present day 25 million kilometers square, not present, sorry, present day is here, um, to you know, a few million kilometers square larger. But when you put dynamic vegetation, you have drastically more uh, drying desertification uh, predicted. A simple model like this. So, of course, it's just a model. And perhaps we can get something. One of the things that comes out of all these land answer interaction studies, the Sahel seems to be a very sensitive region. The, this was, in fact, noted in Charney's own GSM simulation earlier on. And compared to, you know, um, the Middle East and other places. So this is seeing the paleo record. So this is in the middle of the Sahara. So, you know, archaeologists have found these rock paintings that depict deers and <laughs> zebras and so on, and grass and so on. So apparently it was a much wetter place. So Martin Clausen uh, and colleagues at Max Planck Institute uh, did this simulation that showed after the Holocene, you know, the monsoon all pretty much retreated. Um, but their simulation showed, okay, the solar uh, force is relatively gradual. But there is paleo evidence, for example, the dust collected off the coast of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean showed that very rapid increase in dust accumulation. So their model is actually able to simulate this kind of rapid change after they include dynamic vegetation feedback. Otherwise, they uh, don't get it. Um, so both Martin's group and my group have looked at the dynamics of this kind of problem quite a bit. For example, um, the, using the Klimber model, they showed that there is a dependence on basic state. So in the present day, possibly it can have a um, multiple equilibria, a wet state and dry state. While during the Holocene month, while the sun is way up there, um, you may just have uh, one single uh, equilibrium state. So you could look at this kind of problem with relatively simple equation uh, to a degree such that you can use the mathematical to solve it. For example, one of the interesting things <laughs> coming out of this is if you have a nonlinear system, uh, you find a equilibrium here, which could be, let's say, this trough or this trough here, but it's nonlinear. Then if you add climate variability to it, so make this and go up and you know, back and forth, your final average equilibrium state is different, is shifted from your state without um, climate variability. So that can be demonstrated in actual model simulation. For example, here you start for Africa, you start as from old forest, you find the, in an interactive model, you find it settles to a, okay, still forest-like state. And you should start from a desert-like state, you start from zero vegetation, you end up with a desert-like state. So there's multiple equilibria here. But if you introduce variability, you find these two states start to converge towards each other. When your variability is so large, and that kind of wipes out your um, multiple equilibrium states. Finally, um, I want to show a study that is not yet published, um, so led by my colleague uh, Eugenia Kaune, who happened to be a Chinese student who has always had this love the Chinese idea. So we worked on this together, and in fact, so uh, Fred Kujarski and I uh, put together the speedy model with the Vegas dynamic vegetation model a few years back, and this is actually a, then this model is perfect for uh, studying what might happen in the future in a, what you might call renewable energy or geoengineering like kind of setting. There has been quite some, um, effort, including the actual project called Desert Tech. I don't know if anybody heard of it. 
and that actually now uh, is aborted. But seriously, people talk about putting wind farms and solar farms in the Sahara to generate enough energy to supply the whole Europe and North America, no, North Africa energy needs in the future. There. Uh, you can do that kind of back envelope calculation. There's more than enough sunlight there to do that. So then the question for a climate scientist would be, if we do that, what would be the impact on climate? We have seen this region, how sen the monsoon, how sensitive it is to surface condition. So in this modeling work, we basically put solar farms and wind farms over the Sahara. And assuming that you know there's little population, despite of this and that concerns, maybe people might just do it. And so, so here is really the slide that summarizes the result coming out of this speedy Vegas model. Um, first, you see that both wind farm and solar farm alone will cause uh, warming near the surface and reduce an increase in precipitation. If you put them together, the effect's even stronger. What is surprising is still um, the magnitude of change. Precipitation more than doubled. So, especially, you know, south in the southern part, you know, the Sahel. So this really dynamically is, again, has to do with a modification of the, you know, the helicell, the local helicell here of the monsoon, if you like, this region. By changing um, albedo? By, changing there is albedo, yes. Solar, solar changes albedo, and wind farm changes the roughness length, which causes low-level convergence, increase a lot of convergence, which is actually sometimes called the suit mechanism, yoga suit. Right, Frank Goddard was, uh, did some earlier G sim simulation there. Uh, <coughs> so it's both energy and momentum uh, and uh, water modification that led to this very large um, change we see. So of course the consequence of this, you know, is very important if you we have seen, you know, geoengineering, some of them might have adverse effect. And this one seems to, at least by this criteria, seems to be a good thing. Um, anyway, so that concludes uh, my lecture. Thank you very much.